So thank you for coming in. Thank you for giving us this talk and let's, let's see what's up. Yes, thank you guys all so much for coming. Um, and I am absolutely delighted to tell you about tree adjoining grammars and how to parse them. So this talk is gonna have two halves. The first half is introducing the tag formalism for people who haven't seen it yet. And the second half will be giving a, a parsing algorithm for tag that looks a lot like CKY. So for those who already know tag, I'm just gonna bore you for the first half of the talk and I apologize for that. Okay, so, um, so before we go into tree adjoining grammars, let me give some quick motivation. So why do we care about a new grammatical formalism? Well, I mean, the real answer is because we're formal languages there is, and it's fun, um, but I would be remiss if I did not tell you the like official justification for tag, um, which is that some people have argued that uh, natural language is not context free because it contains something called cross serial dependencies. These are structures like this from Swiss German where you have like some number of nouns followed by some number of verbs. So if you translated this word for word into English, I believe it would be um, Hans the house helped paint. Um, and apparently in Swiss German, which I don't know, um, although we have a speaker of Swiss German here at the talk, um, but apparently you can do this uh, multiple times and uh, uh, subject to processing constraints, I believe you can do this to like any depth that you want. And that takes this form of uh, something that resembles the language WW uh, for W in Sigma star, which is not a context free language. So um, if you conclude that language is not context free, then you might say, okay, let's move up one level in the Chomsky hierarchy. Let's try context sensitive languages. Well, there's a problem here, which is that context free languages have this really nice O of N uh, to the third parsing time. And then as soon as you go up to context sensitive languages, it's NP hard. So it'd be really nice if there were something in between these two levels um, that still had a polynomial parsing time, but was more powerful than context free grammars. And it turns out that such a thing exists. Um, and we call these mildly context sensitive grammars and their formalisms such as tag and also a couple equivalent formalisms like CCG and lig, which I won't go into in this talk. Um, and it turns out that there's even more going on inside this Chomsky hierarchy um, because there's another formalism called LCFRS that's even more powerful than tag, but still less powerful than context sensitive languages. So all of these things in between context free and context sensitive are called mildly context sensitive languages. Um, and they're really cool. And it's really too bad that they didn't make it onto the official Chomsky hierarchy. Uh, questions before I show you what a tag is? I do, yeah, I, this is super interesting. Um, and I, Aji Makoto Kanazawa has, has this theory, basically that the Chomsky hierarchy is kind of in the wrong spot. And the sort of starting from Chomsky, you just started from um, uh, Smullyan's elementary formal systems. And I'm trying to convince him to write a paper on this, but I haven't, I haven't yet. And it's a super interesting topic, I think. But yeah, this, we, I've just been talking a lot about this particular thing, and it's just like super cool. And, yeah. Uh, that was a classic novel. That's right. That's a classic more of a comment than a question. Okay. <laughs> no, I would I would love to talk more about this later um, because I'm also very interested in possible alternatives to the Chomsky hierarchy. Um, but since there's many slides, I'd better <laughs> I'd better continue. Um, okay, so now I'm going to show you the tag formalism. So just as a quick overview, uh, tags are made up of something called tree fragments. And they have two rewriting operations, substitution and adjunction. So let me show you tree fragments first. So in context-free grammars, we usually write rules like this. But you could also take these same rules and write them like this um, as tree fragments, where each CFG rule is just like a chunk of a parse tree. So in CFG, each of these tree fragments is one level deep. Um, but in tag, 
they can be any size. So the like grammar rules in tag are going to take the form of these tree fragments. And so you can think of each tree fragment as like a writing rule. Can you guys see my mouse? Yeah, we can. C could I have a question? Yeah. Uh, couldn't the tree fragments be arbitrarily deep in CFG as well, just showing more of the tree? I mean, you could extend. Uh, you could extend CFG with that, but in the standard CFG formalism, they're not. But it's true that it doesn't make it more expressive, right? What's that? It's true. It doesn't it, make it more expressive. True. I will. I will get to that. Yeah, that gives you regular tree grammars. Uh, okay. Maybe I'm envisioning a different a different thing than you guys are. So I think Gail's talking about uh, RTGs or tree substitution grammars. Right. Which do generate more trees than CFGs, just not more strings. Huh. I think yeah. I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> okay. I'll let you carry there was, a, there was a discussion in the Discord about this where I was very confused, and my confusion was clarified by Alex a few weeks ago, if that would help. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna get back to the talk just because there's like a whole lot of slides to get through, and I want to make sure that we actually get to the parsing algorithm, especially since I started late. So yeah, so um, you can think of each of these tree fragments as a rule in your grammar. So like this tree fragment here says VP rewrites as this whole thing, and so um, as I said, tags rewrite using two operations, which are substitution and a junction. And substitution is the same writing process as in CFGs. This is probably what you were thinking when you saw the tree fragments. So in a CFG derivation, um, we rewrite each leaf non-terminal with a tree fragment that's one level deep. And in tag, um, we rewrite each leaf non-terminal with a tree fragment of any size. So this is just like normal CFG substitution. You take a non-terminal, you replace it with a tree fragment. And here, the example I gave is just another use of these, which is, um, which is that with a larger chunk of the tree, you can capture the subcategorization frame of the verb put that it has to take a PP headed by on. But that's just an aside. So, okay, this is like a terminology slide um, that's more for reference. Hmm? Oh, uh, someone already answered. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is this slide is mostly just terminology, and I put it in here more for like people who are looking at these slides later than for this talk. But very quickly, um, this type of tree fragment that we're using in substitution is called an initial tree. Um, a junction will use a different kind of tree fragment that we'll see momentarily. Um, and non-terminals at the leaves are called frontier nodes, and we mark them with this red arrow just to make them easier to see. And all of these have to rewrite with substitution before the tree can be finished. So I'm going to use a lot of schematic drawings in this talk when we do the parsing algorithms. So I'm just going to show you, we draw substitution schematically like this. Um, you have your tree, which has some frontier node uh, named X, and you have some tree fragment rooted at X, and you just plug it in and you get this. So uh, as we've already discussed, this process closely resembles a CFG derivation. Um, and you can, in fact, just build an entire tree using substitution. Um, so some of you might ask, or maybe like have already been thinking about, why do we need a junction? Well, it turns out that if tags only allowed substitution, they would be formally equivalent to CFGs. And so it's a junction that really gives tags their additional power. If you had a tag with just substitution, it would be called a tree substitution grammar, which is its own formalism. And as I think Alex was just saying, it's um, uh, it generates the same strings as CFGs, but different trees. Okay, so now let's look at a junction. So substitution um, inserted a tree fragment at the bottom of a tree. A junction is going to insert a tree fragment into the middle of a tree. So 
um, you've got this sentence here, Justin fired a laser. And what you can imagine is that you take this VP that I've highlighted in blue and you grab it and you pull it apart. So you're making the tree into two halves. And once you've pulled it apart, you can just squeeze your new tree fragment in there. And that's what a junction looks like. It has, um, so you'll notice that the tree fragment that we're adjoining has a VP at the root and also a VP at what's called the foot. And that tells it how to attach to the existing tree. Um, so another terminology slide that I'm gonna go through kind of quickly. Um, the tree fragments used in a junction, these things, they're called auxiliary trees as opposed to the initial trees that we used for substitution. Um, and they each have a footnote. That's, that's basically it. Okay, so um, if you guys are unclear about how a junction works, this is definitely the right time to ask. Sorry, we're having this big side discussion, but... Um, <laughs> I'm totally missing the side discussion. I'll have to read it later. Okay, uh, so uh, I'm That's gonna assume if nobody says anything that you guys all understand a junction. Can I ask a question about the junction? Do the, the two things in blue always have to be the same type? Like the, yes. the, I see. Yes, because like when you're sticking it into the original tree here, like, and you sort of pull the two halves of the tree apart, they're both gonna end up with VP. I guess you could invent some other grammatical formalism where that's not the case, but since, since you're like just focusing on one non-terminal in the tree, um, then yeah, it has to be the same non-terminal. Sorry, I didn't explain that clearly. Does that make sense? I think it makes sense. Uh, okay, cool. This is what we're allowing. It's the definition. <laughs> okay, so now we've got another schematic picture. Um, and so we represent a junction schematically like this. We've got our tree and it has a node labeled X in the middle. So we separate the tree out into two parts and stick our tree fragment in. And I'm gonna be showing a lot of pictures that look like this in the talk. So hopefully the schematic is clear. Okay, so I want to give an example. I think we've got time for an example, yeah. Um, so here is an example of a language that cannot be generated by a context-free grammar. It's a to the n, b to the n, c to the n for n greater than or equal to zero. And here is a tag that generates this language. It has one initial tree and one auxiliary tree. So let me show you how a derivation works in it. Um, so, since, so we have to start out with an initial tree rooted at s and there's exactly one of those. So we choose that one. And now um, derivation ends really whenever you want it to. Um, as long as there's no frontier non-terminals, derivation can end at any time, but you can also keep going as long as you'd like. So let's adjoin something in here. Um, and we have to pick a non-terminal to adjoin it at. Um, well, there's only one choice, so we're going to pick this one. And so we adjoin our auxiliary tree in. Cool. Okay, let's do a junction again. Now let's try adjoining at this middle node S here. So we do that and our tree grows and now you can see we've got A, A, B, B, C, C. So this is looking pretty good, right? Uh, something's not looking right to me. Okay. Maybe that was the point. Couldn't we okay. adjoin in the bottom blue S now and get a sequence that isn't A and B and C and? Yes, exactly. That is what the next slide is. Yeah, so um, so yes, that is exactly the right question. What is to stop us from adjoining in the wrong spot? And so then I go through an example that's like basically the same as you said. Um, the first two steps start out the same. We start with the same initial tree. We uh, adjoin at that same single S. Um, but now, what if? <laughs> What if we were to adjoin at this bottom S or alternatively, what, what if we were to adjoin at the top S but I have but the example shows the bottom S. So what happens? Well, now we've got A, B, A, B, C, C, which is not good. That is not the language that we wanted. So yeah, Gail, you're completely correct about this. 
Um, so the solution here is to mark some nodes as no adjunction. So you see, I've taken the auxiliary tree and I've marked the top and bottom nodes as no adjunction. Um, and so you can't adjoin at those nodes. And so now when we generate, we don't have any problems um, because when we plug in that auxiliary tree, there's only one place that we can adjoin and it's the desired middle node. So there we go, that's the solution. So yeah, adding restrictions like no adjunction makes tag strictly more powerful. Um, and so when people say tree adjoining grammar, I think they usually refer to the version with restrictions. And uh, one restriction is no adjunction. There's also selective adjunction where only trees from a particular set can adjoin at that node. There's obligatory adjunction where something has to adjoin there. Um, tag without these restrictions is less powerful and I think it's not equivalent to CCG and lig. I think the one that's equivalent to CCG and lig is the kind with these restrictions, but I'm not sure. Okay, so given the sensitivity of tag to like the presence or absence of these restrictions, you might be really surprised to learn that if you remove substitution, um, tag does not lose any power. Tag with only a junction is equivalent to tag with both substitution and a junction. I don't know the proof of that. Uh, I find the fact surprising. Um, but we're going to use this during parsing because if we only have to deal with one rewriting operation, it makes our chart parsing rules a lot simpler. Wouldn't that follow from the weak equivalents of, of CFG and TSG? I'm not sure. I don't think so. I can't think off the top of my head of the um, tag with both to tag with just a junction conversion. The, the the reduction is not too hard. You just instead of a substitution node, you just have a node where a thing is going to join, and then you just have these kind of like a wimpy auxiliary trees that only uh, um, okay and a foot next to each other. Yeah, it's, it's actually not very not. Oh, okay, and you just put an epsilon. Um, yeah, like that. Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> That, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. All right, so that, um, oh, I had another example. I'm gonna skip past it for the sake of time, but you can go into the notes and look. Um, it's for the language WW, um, where W is a string of ones and zeros, uh, which is also not context-free. So here's our formal definition. This isn't particularly important for the talk. I just wanted to stick a slide in there for reference. Uh, tags of five tuple. Um, uh, the only thing important on this slide is um, I've told you about the initial trees that are used in substitution and the auxiliary trees, which are used in adjunction. Um, together, those two sets are called the elementary trees. And I think that's the whole uh, intro to tag. Um, so if you have questions about the tag formalism, now is definitely the right time to ask them before we uh, start parsing. Okay, I'm gonna continue. Okay, so, um, so I'm gonna show you an O of n to the sixth time parsing algorithm. I, I think all the tag algorithms are all the tag parsing algorithms are O of n to the sixth. And this one resembles CKY. And I personally got it out of this Alonso et al. paper from 1999. That's where I learned it. Um, but I believe it was invented in the 1980s. Um, most of the work on tags was done in like the 1980s by Aravind Joshi's lab. Okay, so before we do tag parsing, um, since, since the tag parsing algorithm is going to look like CKY, I thought it would be useful to just like write out CKY as a review. Um, so as you guys recall, um, CKY is a dynamic programming algorithm for parsing context-free grammars. Um, and the context-free grammars have to be in Chomsky normal form, which means that all rules look like one of these three things. It's either one non-terminal rewrites as two non-terminals, one non-terminal rewrites as a terminal. And the only thing that's allowed to rewrite as epsilon is the start symbol. So um, we have inference rules that we can use to build up the, um, the parse. Um, 
So this actually, so I'm going to use a lot of this notation, this deductive parsing notation. So if people have not seen this before, then I want to, I want to take time to go through it. Um, so at the top, we write the premises. Um, and at the bottom, we write the conclusions. So if the premises are true, we can infer the conclusions. So these are our initialization rules. Um, if S goes to epsilon is in the grammar, then we can infer an S from zero to zero. Um, and if our string has zero length, that lets us finish parsing, otherwise it's not useful. Um, then, if for, then we have an initialization for our terminal rules. Um, for the I plus one word in the sentence, if we have a rule A goes to that word, then we can posit an A at that spot. And uh, we, uh, the, the indices I are noting the spaces between words, not the words themselves, which is why we have I, I plus one here. And so now, uh, so these two are just initialization. Um, they don't require any pre-existing chart cells. Now we have an in inference rule which requires some chart cells to already be filled out. Um, so if we have a B from I to J and C from J to K, and we have a rule that says A rewrites as BC, then we can posit an A from I to K. Uh, I'm assuming that everyone's familiar with this algorithm. I apologize for those who aren't. So this is mainly just to introduce the chart parsing notation. And then we can write our goal, um, which is that we want to find an S um, from zero to N. And if we find that, then we've succeeded at parsing. Does anyone have questions about the chart parsing notation? Okay, cool. So here's our plan of attack. Um, our goal is to develop a tag parsing algorithm, which looks like CKY. Um, and so when I first saw this algorithm, I was super, super confused by it. And it took me like many, many hours staring at the paper to understand why this algorithm worked. So I'm gonna walk you through the intuitions that I basically went through when I was trying to understand it. And so the first question I asked when trying to understand this is, why can't we just use CKY to parse tags? Why wouldn't it work? Um, and as we explore why it's not going to work, that will help us develop the intuitions that we need um, to adapt CKY to tags. And so once I've given you those intuitions, then we'll cover the actual formal details. So um, before we get, begin, we're going to make some assumptions about the structure of our tree fragments. Um, we're going to assume that all of our tree fragments are binary branching. This is similar to the Chomsky normal form constraint in CKY, although I don't actually know anything about tag normal forms. Um, and we're also going to assume that our tag only uses a junction, not substitution, um, but it'll be easy to extend the algorithm later if we want to. And we will ignore constraints like no adjunction for the sake of brevity, but those are also really easy to add into the algorithm later adding non-binary branching uh, trees is harder to add into the algorithm later, since this is a CKY-like algorithm. OK, so, um, so let's look at our first intuition. So our goal, once again, is to develop parsing rules, which look kind of like the CKY parsing rule, where we take um, two constituents and like merge them together um, based on a rule to get a new constituent. So in the CKY rule, um, the deduction rule parses an entire CFG rule at once. And so one thought for what our tag rules might look like is maybe the tag equivalent should also parse a whole tree fragment at once. Um, well, if we try that, we run into two issues. Uh, the first issue is that it's going to mess up our binarization. If we try to parse this whole tree fragment at once, we basically have to like flatten it down to one level, um, at which point you get uh, something in this case with four children instead of two children at each node. So then you can't use a CKY style thing. Um, but the bigger problem is that um, if you have a tree fragment and you wanna parse it, something might've gotten adjoined inside it. And so it might be sort of split into multiple pieces in your parse tree. So if you try to parse this fragment all at once, um, and it's got this Y inside of it, 
um, your parsing algorithm is just going to get confused. So the first intuition then is that we want to split our tree fragments up into their component CFG rules. So if we have this auxiliary tree in our grammar, um, then we're going to split it into four CFG rules. Um, and we're just going to do a little bit of bookkeeping. We'll label each one with gamma, the tree that was in this tree's gamma. And we'll label it with a number saying which uh, CFG rule it is. I seem to have mislabeled some of these because I've got P gamma 2 here and P gamma 3 here. That's a mistake. This should say gamma 2. All right, questions before I move on to the second intuition? Uh-oh, no questions. That could either mean you all understand it or you're all oh, really lost. One question. Okay. If we know how to normalize CFGs, can we normalize tree adjoining grammars at this stage? Um, I actually uh, don't know how to put a tag into normal form. Um, but I don't think that putting it into a normal form would help us with parsing. Probably. Unless the normal form somehow made everything just be one, uh, one level deep. The majority comments other than that are that the slides are great. I would like to take you back two slides if possible. Yeah. To this one? Yeah. Could you did just go through this a little bit slower? Why would we be flattening this? Um, so, uh, so imagine that we're trying to parse a whole tree fragment at once. Yeah. So then we're going to have something like this, where like, uh, I guess this is, uh, this is something that got substituted in or adjoined in. See, this is, this is pretty hand wavy at this point, because we're just trying to build up the intuition and this doesn't right. look like a tag parsing rule yet. Um, but I was imagining something where, like, if you want to write a rule like this, and you're just, and, and, and this part, instead of A goes to B, C, is, instead of that, it's like a whole tree fragment, mm -hmm. then somehow these chart cells are going to have to look at the whole tree fragment, which means they're going to have to, like, vary over all of the, the things of the leaves. Like, they're just going to have to look at more than two pieces, basically. Yeah. Um, and these are really just intuitions. So if like a particular intuition is not working for you, um, but you sort of buy into why we need to split it up into tree fragments, or sorry, split it into, into depth one rules, then, then you can ignore this part of the intuition if you like. Fair enough. Thanks. But yeah, if, if this whole thing, if why we don't wanna do, sorry, if it's not clear why we wanna do this, I can try to clarify it more. I'm all right with the doing it anyway. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, so once you've got it split up, then we might want to ask, uh, how about now, can we make parsing rules that kind of look like this? So this parsing rule is going to have three parts to it. Here's our rule. So this is for, I, I did it as an example for this rule. Um, so we've got our grammar rule, and then maybe we've parsed an NP from J to K. And we've parsed a P from I to J. Can we combine those into the PP? Why can't we just use CFG parsing at this time? And that's where we come to intuition two, um, which is that parsing bottom up would require us to keep a stack. So let me illustrate that um, in more detail. Uh, suppose we're parsing this tree right here. Um, it's got exactly two tree fragments in it. It's got alpha, our initial tree, and beta, an auxiliary tree that was adjoined inside it. Um, so imagine what happens when we're parsing this. So, uh, so sorry, that triangle here is the bottom part. So we're parsing this bottom part of alpha. Um, and we start parsing it using our CFG style rules. And everything goes OK until we get to this non-terminal, x alpha 5, um, where beta happened to be adjoined. So what do we do then? Well, we're going to start parsing beta, but as we parse beta, we have to keep track of um, where we were in alpha so that we can resume parsing alpha later. So as we're going up 
um, the, the tree in beta, we have to just like keep a little note that says alpha five is where we left off. So then when we get to the top um, and we get to the root of beta, which is gonna be X, then we can fill in the alpha five. And then we can continue parsing the tree as desired. Uh, so great, um, we're done parsing. Uh, what's the problem? Why can't we use the strategy? Well, the issue arises um, when you've got more tree fragments. So this could have an arbitrary depth. So imagine the case where you've got three tree fragments. First, your initial tree was alpha, then you adjoined beta, then you adjoined, sorry, then you adjoined beta one, then you adjoined beta two inside of beta one. So as you're parsing this, like as you're going up, first you're gonna have to keep track of where you were in alpha as you're parsing beta one. And when you get to beta two, now you've gotta keep track of two things. You've gotta keep track of where you were in alpha and where you were in beta one. So uh, if you take this to its logical conclusion and you imagine this for arbitrary depth trees, then parsing tags this way would require us to keep a stack. Um, and a naive stack implementation would require an exponential amount of chart cells, I believe. I didn't double check that when I copied it out of my 2013 notes into these slides, but I think it's exponential. I have an excitable uh, question. Okay. Why don't we just, the second, we're at the bottom bottom tree and we're trying to go up and we, we were in alpha and we hit beta one. Why don't we just forget that we were in alpha completely, start dealing with beta one, uh, continue just forgetting until we finally manage to parse a tree completely, unadjoin it, replace it with the place it was adjoined into, and then start the process again, which- You may be anticipating the final algorithm. I'm not 100% sure what you're saying, but it, it sounds like you may be anticipating the final algorithm. Okay. There's a dependency though. So you'd have to pop back up. Yeah, so if you're doing it in this bottom up fashion that we're talking about, like suppose you start parsing alpha, you forget where you were in alpha, you get to the top of beta one, then you have like this X non-terminal at the top of beta one and you need to finish parsing alpha, but you don't really know where you were in alpha. You don't know what rule you're at. So you can't really keep parsing. But I can't just complete parsing beta one at that point, uh, wrap it into a single object and then start again from the bottom. That you can That's do. what we're gonna do. You, you are uh, you're yeah. giving spoilers for my talk, Gail. That's exactly the algorithm. Yeah. Uh, nice. I'm glad. I'm glad my intuitions worked well enough to to make the algorithm clear. That's awesome. Uh, nice. So yeah. Uh, and also, uh, just because Ryan's in the audience, I feel a need to mention that actually you probably could do it with a stack using something called Lang's algorithm. And I think that would provide an alternative tag parsing algorithm, but that's not the one we're gonna do now. Um, the one we're gonna do now is the one that Gail um, figured out um, where we're gonna parse inside out. So, uh, so yeah, instead of parsing bottom up, we're gonna parse inside out. And intuitively this makes some sense because like think about how we generate in a CFG. We generate top down, right? Filling in the tree from top to bottom. But then we act when we actually go to chart parse in CKY, we parse bottom up. So we're sort of adding rules back into our parse sort of in the reverse order that the tree was actually built during generation. And we're gonna, follow that same sort of principle for tag parsing, um, which is uh, we're gonna, so in tags we generate outside in, sorry, this looks really weird when I draw um, the tag, um, this is like the initial tree prior to anything being adjoined into it. And then as we start adjoining, we like fill in the middle of the tree. Um, sorry, that's a weird drawing. Um, but yeah, so we adjoin outside in and when we parse, we're gonna parse inside out. We're gonna start with the most recently adjoined tree 
we're going to parse the next most recently adjoined tree around it, and then we can finally parse the outermost one. So more schematically, it's going to look like this. Is this what you were thinking, Gail? Yep. Awesome. OK. <laughs> So yeah, so this is pretty much what I just said. Um, and let's take a look at this in more detail. Um, so suppose we're parsing our tree from earlier, which has two fragments, alpha and beta. Um, we're going to start with beta. And since beta has nothing adjoined inside it, we can just parse it up using our, we can parse it bottom up using our ordinary CFG style rules. And then when we go to parse alpha, we can start parsing alpha bottom up. And when we hit beta, since we've already parsed all of beta, we can just add it in in one chart parsing step. Um, and then we uh, parse the rest of alpha just in the normal bottom up fashion. So um, we're going we're gonna to start looking at formal details and how to actually implement this. Um, so this seems like a good time to pause for questions. Okay, moving on. So now we're going to start adding our like span information in so we understand what we need to keep track of in the chart cells and what the parsing rules are going to look like. So let's suppose that this lower part of alpha spans from P to Q and beta spans from i to k. Well, um, imagine we're just parsing somewhere inside alpha that doesn't involve beta. Um, what does this rule look like? Uh, well, uh, suppose when we first decomposed alpha, we got this rule, x alpha 3 goes to y alpha 4, z alpha 5. So in ordinary bottom-up CFG parsing, we would do something like this, where we combine these two constituents and the rule into one bigger constituent. This is just a drawing of the exact same CFG parsing rule that we keep seeing. Um, but I thought it might be helpful to see it as a picture in addition to as a deductive parsing rule. So what does it look like when we want to adjoin beta? Well, now we're going to add a new thing in. We're going to add uh, this beta here. For, um, so Sorry, this is uh, somehow these uh, these indices ended up inconsistent with the picture on the left, and I apologize. Um, but yeah, suppose that we now have the bottom chunk of alpha. Um, we have just something in the rest of alpha. Then we can stick Z in like this, and this would give us a big chart parsing rule like this which looks exactly the same as the CKY rule, um, except that now um, we've changed the indices of Z alpha five, and we've also included the beta rule. It's not actually gonna look this complicated in practice. Um, if we actually included all of this, it would make it more than O of N to the sixth, I think. So uh, we're gonna split this up into two rules. First, we're gonna combine these two and then we can combine this with this. That's but this is just to give intuitions. Okay, so um, there's a further complication that arises now. What, where's the, where do we keep the index? Where, uh, which index? Like wh where do we know that we have the node that has the same non-terminal as the one that we're adjoining to? What's the... What's um, the node that has the same non-terminal. Well, where, where are we enforcing the rule that the adjoining part has to stay in the same phrase level or whatever that was? Oh man, you guys are like fantastic. You are all anticipating my slides right before I get to them. Um, so I Sorry. think I think what you're asking is answered by the next slide. If it's not, please stop me. Um, but I think what you're picturing is something like this. When you've got beta, beta has a footnote and you have to make sure that like the footnote spans P to Q so that you can plug the bottom of alpha into the correct spot. Is that, is that what you're saying? Uh, no, but it's, it's better. 
Okay. <laughs> that makes more sense than what I was asking for. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so uh, we have to keep track of where the hole is in beta. Um, and by the hole, I mean like the place where the bottom of alpha is going to join. So in our rule for beta, we're going to stick in PQ, which is the location of the hole, and we're going to keep track of that. And that's why we start getting up to O of n to the sixth, because we've now got four indices in our chart cell. And it turns out we're actually going to like expand this so that all of the chart cells keep track of a hole, but I've just put it in this one chart cell for now uh, to illustrate. Okay, are you guys ready for the full formal details of the algorithm? Could I ask a quick question? Yeah. Wouldn't it make be closer to CKY if you put the um this is a really minor detail, the I the IJ where the PQ is if you swap those two rules? Um because CKY you mean just in terms of what the variables are named? No, like where they're positioned. I don't think I understand. Like you'd write uh the Y A4 should be next to should be the left of the Z B1. Um, because it's like, I don't know. it's like CKY, except you have this whole PQ. Yeah. Um, sorry, I think I don't understand. Like, you're not just asking, like, if we rearranged our deductive I, parsing. That's exactly rules, what I'm asking. Yeah. What, oh, you, uh, is there a reason I chose to put these two Zs next to each other because I thought it was clear in the slide. Um, Obviously, the order of the um, the premises in the deductive parsing rule don't really matter. And anyway, we're not going to have this rule in the final thing. This is just to show a lot of it at once. We're going to factorize this into two rules, which you'll see soon. OK. Ready for formal details? How are we doing on time? OK, we've got tons of time. We've got time to get through the whole talk. This is great. Um, oh, so one one last thing. I think this is just like further cementing Gal's intuition from earlier. Um, if we use the adjunction rule, then we don't need a stack. Um, and that's because we only ever need to keep track of one incomplete tree fragment at a time. Um, but we still get unlimited nesting of tree fragments. That's because like in this rule here, when we adjoin beta, for all we knew, beta could have had all kinds of other things adjoined in it first. So you could imagine that it had beta two hanging out inside of it. Um, and the rules that are adjoining beta into alpha don't care. Um, and so that's how we get, uh, that's how we do it inside out. That's how we, um, we get unlimited nesting of tree fragments. Okay, it is time for the formal details. So now, the rest of the talk might be boring because I'm like literally just going to talk about what chart cells look like. So each chart cell takes this form. Um, you've got a non-terminal X, you've got a tree fragment gamma that X was in, and you've got N, which just keeps track of our position in gamma. Um, then you've got I and K, which are the start and end positions of the chart cell. And you have P and Q, which are the start and end positions of the whole. Now, not everything's gonna have a hole in it. You might be like in a part of the tree that just doesn't have a hole in it, in which case we'll just leave P and Q blank. Can I ask a question? Yeah. I'm a bit lost on positions inside the tree. How are we numbering it? Is it breadth first, depth first? What's going on? Ah, this is in terms of the words in the sentence. So this will be like position I in the sentence, which is, I guess, between word i minus one and word i, or no, word i and word i plus one. Okay, thanks. Sorry, I don't have a drawing of this. And I can't draw on my computer, that's why I have to draw these Tixi drawings because I don't have a way of drawing while I'm on my computer. But yeah, it's just, it's uh, the, you can think of i, k, p, and q um, as all just positions in the sentence. That clears out, thanks. Okay, cool. All right, so um, there's gonna be several rules. I think there's seven rules in total, so I've split them up over different slides. Um, we start out with our initialization rules. Um, 
Uh, so this is like when you're writing your dynamic programming algorithm, this is just the initialization step before you've filled in any chart cells. So none of these require different chart cells the premise. So you've got a terminal rule, which is like the same thing as in CKY, um, where if X goes to W I plus one, um, and where that's the I plus one word in your sentence, and you have this rule, then you can posit um, an X from I to I plus one. Similarly, um, if you have an X uh, goes to epsilon rule, you can posit this at every position I in the tree. So those should be straightforward. And then the foot rule, let's see, I seem to have a typo here. I meant to say F is the foot non-terminal of gamma. So if F is the foot non-terminal of gamma, um, then you can posit a chart cell that goes from I to K and also a hole that goes from I to K. Um, and this will trigger for every auxiliary tree gamma um, and every pair I, K of positions. So this is like a really weird rule. And I think this is one of the ones that's hardest to gain an intuition for because it's like just the hole. Um, you're just saying there's gonna be a hole here. Um, and so I like to say, uh, this rule is like making a donut um, by first making the hole and then wrapping the dough around the hole. This is Do you guys have questions about these terminal rules? I mean, sorry, initialization rules? This is for all i and k? Yes. Um, these, uh, yeah, this will just sort of go and try every i um, and k and place one of these wherever it applies. And since the only premise here is that f is the foot, is f is the foot non-terminal of a rule gamma, um, then yeah, it's just going to place it at every spot. Because before you start parsing, you don't really know <laughs> where there might be a hole. You just have to assume there might be a hole anywhere and then start parsing the rest of the tree fragment around it. Sorry, this might be a silly question, but does, does each cell contain multiple rules? Um, e, uh, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I, so it sort of depends for, on what you mean CKY. by, hmm? that, That's true for every CKY. Surface. You know, I, it sort of, it sort of depends what you mean by this. Also, I apologize. Apparently I completely forgot to put, um, the PQ part in these rules. You should imagine here, and I'll correct this in the slides. You should imagine that there was a line and then dashes to say there is no hole. Um, but yeah, so uh, there's only going to be one chart cell that has F gamma IK IK, but you could have some like other inference rule that led you to posit the same chart cell. Is that what you mean? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, that answers you can, my question. Yeah, you can absolutely have that. And so if you're doing this, so I've just presented this as like a, a decision problem, like does the tag generate this string or not? Um, if you want to actually extract the parse, then you have to keep back pointers in your chart cells as usual. Okay, so now we're gonna do the CKY like rules. Um, these are internal rules, which is like, you're not doing any adjunction you're just parsing stuff that's internal to some tree fragment. So, okay, another piece of terminology. Um, in an auxiliary tree, you've got the path from the root um, all the way down to the foot, uh, and that path is called the spine. Um, and so you'll have some non-terminals that are along the spine, and then you might have some more non-terminals off on the sides elsewhere that are not on the spine. If it is on the spine, it's gonna dominate the foot node and therefore the hole. And if it's not on the spine, it's not gonna dominate the foot node and the hole. So when we're parsing some internal CFG like rule, there's gonna be three possible cases. In the first case, Y dominates the hole. And so then uh, Y needs to be filled in with PQ and 
uh, you need to have posited a Y with PQ and you needed to have posited a Z with no hole. And then you can infer an X from I to K, which um, inherits its hole from Y. So it's also at PQ. And then the rest of this is just the same. This is just the grammar rule. Um, this is the same, basically the same chart parsing rule we've been seeing the whole time. All right, so yeah. So then the other, the next option is that Z dominates the whole and it's just the same, but in reverse. Now Y doesn't have a whole and Z does and X inherits its whole from Z. And then the third possibility is that neither one dominates the whole because neither Y nor Z is on the spine of the tree. And in this case, um, you just posit X with a blank hole. Uh, so I want to be- hmm? One question here, if I could. Uh, yeah. The discussion of dominating the whole is actually um, just intuition, right? Because we're not checking if Y or, or Z dominates the whole. We're just saying, if you've got these rules, then this is what you get. Okay, that's a really good question. Um, so actually you can infer this just from the grammar um, because you have your tree fragment and it's already been broken up into pieces. And so you can just look to see which non-terminals were on the spine. And so you can know in advance that Y was on the spine and needs to have the hole filled in. But, but isn't it effectively marked in the grammar? Like you could have that rule and you could have, it could dominate both holes. Like you could have in different places. Uh, there's only going to be one hole per auxiliary tree. No, per tree, but I mean like that, that the rule X goes to YZ could have a, a Y dominate the hole and a Z dominate the hole, and those could both be in the same grammar. Yes, um, but all of these are uh, subscripted with the specific auxiliary tree that it came from. Oh, I see. Um, so there would have to be some other auxiliary tree delta that Z was subscripted with. And it wouldn't be. Can trees only have one hole? Wait, sorry, I didn't hear it, Gail. Can trees only have one hole? Yes. Um, the, uh, the auxiliary trees have exactly one foot node, and so that's going to result in exactly one hole. And if I could return to the first question, does that mean? Yeah. In order to apply these rules, we should first be testing if Y or Z are indeed on the spine? Um, yeah, uh, you probably want to do that. Although, honestly, I think you should just be able to get it for free. Like if you're parsing up the tree. Uh, but yeah, no, you do need to test it um, because that will tell you uh, which one to copy PQ out of. But you don't even need to look at the grammar. You can just have like a rule in your code that looks and says like, okay, if PQ is filled in on Y's side, but not Z, then you take it from Y. If it's filled in on Z's side, but not Y, then you take it from Z. And if it's filled in on neither, then you don't fill it in either. Okay, so you don't actually worry about the spine. You just- Yeah, um, you don't actually have to do any calculations on the grammar for this. I think you pretty much get it for free. Cool. Yeah, and I could have written this as, one chart parsing rule where I had some like complicated rule at the bottom that says like max of the holes. And like, if, if this were like P1 and this were P2, I could say something like max of P1, P2, where that means that it's filled in or something. But I felt that dividing it into three cases was easier for, for demonstrating what's going on. Okay, we've got one more chart parsing rule. Are you guys ready? Yep. Okay. Uh, we're gonna do the adjunction rule. Um, and this is basically the same principle as the picture that we saw earlier, um, where we, uh, but now we're like just combining uh, beta and the bottom of alpha. We're not doing anything else here. So suppose you've got, um, the bottom of alpha, or I guess it's gamma in this example. But in our picture earlier, suppose you've got the bottom of alpha um, and it's an X from I prime to K prime. And uh, it might have its own hole, PQ, um, or it might be blank. 
Uh, and now you've got beta, which has to have a hole. Um, it has to have a hole from I prime to K prime so that you know you can stick this I prime to K prime thing in the hole. And then you can combine them and get a new chunk of the tree from I to K, which inherits its hole from the bottom tree fragment. So we're done. That's it. That's tag parsing. Um, and just for runtime stuff, um, this is the most complicated rule. It's got uh, six different variables in it. Uh, I prime, K prime, I, K, P, and Q. And you're going to have to uh, range over them from zero to N. Um, so that gives us a runtime of O of N to the sixth. And that's our, that's our complexity. One question. <laughs> For those who are new to this deductive parsing notation, it's really great um, because you can always just read off the runtime directly from the parsing rules by looking to see how many different variables there are. That's great. Um, I have one question. Uh, yeah. What, the X gamma and the beta <coughs> root. Could you remind me which is which and why we have X gamma at the bottom and not beta root? And not what? Sorry. Not beta root. Um, you mean beta foot? Oh, uh, yeah. sorry. I really should have copied the picture in here. Um, this is like the bottom. So like, so remember when we were parsing alpha and then we adjoined beta in and then we kept parsing alpha. This is like the bottom of alpha. Uh huh. And this is this is beta, like the entirety of beta. Huh. Where's the rest of alpha? Um, okay. We're going to start parsing the top of alpha right now. Um, here, actually, let me go back. Um, so what we're doing here is basically we're combining this chunk with this chunk. Um, and we're just doing this in this rule. We're not adding in this part. Huh. OK, thanks. So, so, so yeah, this is this is gonna keep track of its whole J prime, K prime. Um, oh no, sorry, this is gonna keep track of its whole P, Q. This in turn might have another hole that's not drawn on this picture. Uh, I have a question. I really should have copied this picture over. Can, can I ask something? Um, so do we need to change the way that we traverse the like the, the bottom triangular matrix or something? Or do we still start at the word level and work our way up? Uh, good question. I actually don't know off the top of my head because I think so much in terms of these uh, these inference rules that I just assume some some system is gonna automatically figure out the, um, the order for us. Um, let me think for a second. Uh, it sounds like it should work because like we're, it's inside out, but it's still yeah, kind of. I don't know. Yeah, I think you should be able to just go bottom up in increasing order of like the i to k span, and then yeah, yeah, we're still only using rules that enlarge or keep the span right. Yeah, yeah, that should work. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, you should just be able to go bottom up because you will have parsed the like inner, the, you'll have parsed the auxiliary tree. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I can't give a clear explanation, but I, I agree with you. You can just do bottom up. I think you'll have to be a little bit careful when you do that. I, it works, but you'll have to run deductive closure in each cell, right? Whereas CKY, you just have to do basically a matrix product to populate What's a cell. What's deductive closure? So you, you might, at a given cell, you might need to adjoin many times to produce the thing that would then feed forward in the parse. And so you have to, you may have to run, you know, the foot rule and the adjunction rule and and and, and some of your smaller constituents. So yes, you can visit the, the chart cells in that triangular order, but it's not just apply one rule at each cell. Okay, that's the same principle as um, parsing unary rules, right? Very similar, yes. Okay. 
Do we have anything that's like a unary rule here beyond the epsilon? Yeah, you could totally have a unary rule. We have not ruled out unary rules. But we didn't rule it in, did we? And you didn't give an example of one. Um, I actually did. Uh, oh, but I was curious what Noof said. Is it true that you look, need... look a unary rule? See, what's a nullary? No, the, the, the foot rule. <laughs> Come on, it's kind of unary. <laughs> oh, it's it's very different. If you try to learn right. it, it's annoying. But you can anyway. totally have unary rules. But my point is, if we don't have, do we need to do the deductive closure if we don't have nullaries or unaries? I think so. Um, um, I think that, yeah, I'll, I'll let Wes answer that. I, I, I think an example of that is, um, imagine you've got a rewrite that S goes to, um, well, I'm trying to. Hmm. Can you go back a second? I, I, let me see if I can. So imagine you've got a rewrite that S goes to ABC. Um, a is going to combine with a child from I to J, or sorry, A is going to merge with a child from I to J. C is going to merge with a child from J to K, uh, and then a series of epsilon, a series of rules terminating in epsilon will will replace B. I see. So right? you're using no. Uh, yes. Great. Then, then um, I agree. I mean, I was my point. I think that's actually a harder thing because it's not just the closure. You have to solve the a weird weighted system to get rid of those. It's not going to be well here. It's just deductive closure. Oh, right, right, because it's it's unweighted, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I did not want to put weights in this talk. So, could could, you, could someone explain why it's not just the matrix product again? Then, like, maybe I'm just confused. If you have a unilateral you know, rule in CKY, it's not a matrix product because uh, that's very hard to explain, but I can send you, I'll, I'll probably have a paper that does it. Stolke's paper does it. Okay, great. Because that's how I'm used to thinking of it is just, as a, and I was thinking that this was quite similar, that it's really just a sort of more advanced idea of the matrix product, which I thought was kind of cool, but apparently it's more complicated. <laughs> you, might, you might be able to, um, I think all of the other closure steps are uh, dependent only on the grammar and not of the sentence. So you might be able to basically pre-compute the sort of matrix product-like operator, yeah. if you like. Right. So I can't think of this as like a parsing monoid, right? Where I just have the matrix as elements and then however I combine them as like co co combinations or it, something, right? It may be the case if you if you think of it as the grammar will tell you the star, uh, the star operator of that monoid. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, th okay, that's what I was missing. But whereas in CKY, there's just a fixed operator. Right, right. Okay, so this doesn't have that. That's interesting, okay, right. If you had cool. CKY with nullaries, you'd have the same thing, I think. Mm -hmm. Or you had a grammar with nullaries. Isn't that right, Nuf? I That seems right, yes. So this is what Stolke in the, the paper I pasted 4.7 addresses exactly that issue. And it's, oh, great. Okay. It's really tedious. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn off screen sharing. Um, so let me thank just show my, my phew, it's over. <laughs> the talk is over slide. And then the thank you. Thank you guys for coming. What's that, the 58? Uh, you are missing a slide. You have one more slide. References. Oh. <laughs> Thank you so much, Darcy. Thank you. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm still Wait. here and I can I can actually leave the slides up. I just wanted to like formally conclude the talk before we just like spend a while discussing, although this is fascinating and I can stick around indefinitely. So I had a question based on what Nuf was saying. Do I need to have, do I need to have null arrays to make tag as powerful as it is? Could I remove them like I could in a CFG? Um, that's a good question. Um, are any of the like actual tag experts in here still? No, it looks like David had to leave. Um, I suspect you could. You could always just fold it. You could just like merge it with the other rules. Um, like, it sounded like we were using epsilons. Like, do you remember the conversion that David suggested for removing substitution from the grammar and only including a junction? It sounded like that relied on the existence of epsilon rules. 
Yeah, but you could always remove them afterwards, right? Like I could have a, an FSA construction that relies on epsilons and then later remove them. I don't know. The cost I... might be that your grammar is like the output grammar is exponentially big in the size oh, sure. of the input grammar. Yeah, that's right. It gets gigantic. It can get bigger. <laughs> yeah, it can blow up. Well, there's a difference between like linearly blowing up and just like every rule combines with every other rule. But that's also true of even like, you know, regular grammars, right? Like they can just get gigantic if you're not careful with epsilons. Not with epsilons, not with determinization. Epsilons, I don't think will blow up exponentially. Because you just see the epsilon closure of every state, more or less. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know about tag. I'm not a tag expert. <laughs> That's why I'm so happy that you had these slides. Yeah. Now that I've um, now that I've stopped uh, screen sharing, I can finally catch up on the, the chat and see what you guys are talking about this whole time. I think I'll stop recording at this point. I'm not going to end the thing just.